Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. And sadly, if people don't get a good start in life, they can waste, yes I said waste, their whole entire life searching for self-worth. The first one that I want to talk to you about is just love. It's actually the answer to finding our self-worth. Everybody in the world just wants to be valuable. We just want to know that we matter. We want to know that we mean something to somebody. And sadly, if people don't get a good start in life, they can waste, yes, I said waste, their whole entire life searching for self-worth, and they look for it in all the wrong places, in what they do, the people they know, the label in their clothes, how they look. Very often, it's what kind of work that people do. They think that they're valuable if they can be the president or have their name on an office door, but they feel like they have no value if maybe they do some kind of a menial job. The thing we have to understand that our worth and value is not and never can be in any of that. Maybe we look more valuable to the world, but not to God. And when push comes to shove, when all this is over, there's only going to be God. And we need to be a little more concerned about his principles and what he has to say about us than we are the people that are rapidly passing through our lives. Do you know that many of the people, most of the people, other than maybe a marriage or your children, that you are involved with right now, there's a good possibility that 10 years from now they won't even be in your life? Wow. I'm not really comfortable with change. Well, <laughs> too bad, because it's happening all the time. I mean, there are people that I thought would always be a part of my life, and always maybe work in the ministry. People that we started with, and they're just not there anymore. And new people come along. And we learn how to trust God with that. But when you get your worth and value in what people think of you, and, and whether they applaud you or don't applaud you, we're making a big mistake when we do that because it derails our destiny. The Apostle Paul said, and it's recorded in Galatians 1.10, if I were trying to be popular with people, I would not right now be an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I can tell you, if I was trying to be popular with people, I would not be doing what I'm doing today because when I made the decision to follow the call of God on my life, I was very unpopular and very rejected. I was asked to leave my church. I lost all my friends. Family members came against us. It's not always easy to do what God is asking you to do, but in the long run, it's the only thing that works long term. You are valuable, not because you look a certain way or don't look a certain way, not because you have uh, some kind of a title that goes along with your job or because you do whatever you would think would be the lowliest job on earth, your value is not tied up in any of that stuff. What was my condition after being abused by my father and abandoned into the situation by my mother who knew what he was doing but didn't have the courage to stand up to him? What, what was I like? I felt worthless. I felt guilty and condemned. I felt used. I felt damaged, my personality was all messed up, and I tried so hard to find some kind of worth and value in all the wrong things. Getting in the right group, even at church, getting in the right church group. You think there's not cliques inside churches? <laughs> Let me tell you something, there's always the group to be part of. And I worked so hard to be part of that group and I finally got what I wanted, and they were the first ones to reject me when God called me to teach the Word. Then I wanted to take a minute and address our TV audience. 
I know that there are many, many, many of you watching this program right now. You may be laying in a bed sick. You may be sitting in a chair somewhere deeply depressed. You may have been abused in your childhood. You may have been rejected, abandoned. Perhaps your spouse just walked off and left you with a house full of kids and you don't know what in the world you're going to do. And you feel like the tail end of everything and that nobody loves you and you don't even love you. Well, I want you to listen to me. God loves you. I said, God loves you. And I want you to receive that right now by faith. I want you to step out and say, can God love me? Yes, God can love you because God is perfect and he can do anything that he wants to. And he doesn't love you because you deserve it. And that's what makes it so amazing. He loves us in spite of ourselves. And I felt like this morning that God put on my heart that if I would just take a moment to do that, that there's an anointing for people to receive that love right now. And I can tell you that love is what's going to rescue you out of the pit and out of corruption. God loves you. It doesn't matter who doesn't love you. God does love you. Amen. Now, the next thing that's important about this love thing is you've got to learn to love yourself. Most people don't even like themselves, let alone love themselves. It's the truth. I don't like this about me, and I don't like that about me. I don't like this about me, and I don't like that about me. Well, why don't you just embrace all of you today? You're stuck with you. I said you're stuck with you. You better like yourself because everywhere you go, there you are. You know what? It's a scary thought to think that I will never for one second in my whole life ever get away from me. I mean, that's pretty frightening. So I finally decided, I mean, I don't enjoy even spending one hour with somebody I don't like. So to spend your whole life with somebody you don't like is really a nightmare. So I suggest that you decide today to come to terms of peace with yourself, embrace the who you are in Christ, and say, I love it, I love it all. And I challenge you every day to say out loud at least four or five times, I love myself. You don't need to say it to somebody, but just between you and God. <laughs> Might not work too good if you went to work and said, I love myself, I love myself, oh, I love myself. You just have no idea. It just about gives the devil a nervous breakdown. <laughs> when you start saying, I like myself. Yeah, yeah. Matter of fact, I just love myself. I value myself in Christ. Hey, I'm not where I need to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. <laughs> Woo, I'm making progress. <laughs> Amen. And the next thing that we need to do after that, I guess I could say that this is probably one of the most important messages that I ever learned in my life. I mean, they all seem really important to me, but even out of these 10 or 12 that I'm going to share with you, there are three or four that just stand out even more brightly than some of the others. And one of them is what I'm getting ready to talk to you about now, which is really developing and focusing on walking in love with other people. You see, everything that God gives us as a free gift, he wants us to give away as a free gift. It's to you and through you. We receive mercy from God, and then he tells us to be merciful. We receive kindness from God, be kind. We receive patience from God, be patient. The wonderful thing about God is he never expects us to do something that he doesn't equip us to do. He always shows us the way by first treating us the way he wants us to treat other people. Loving people is about forgiving people. It's about being merciful to people, long-suffering with people. Hey, listen, I've had people in my life that I've wanted to give up on too. I'm quite sure that Dave wanted to give up on me a number of times. But you know what? I don't even think for him it was even an option because 
He trusted God that if he would keep loving me, that God could change me. You see, I didn't really need somebody to tell me about Jesus. I needed somebody to show me Jesus. Are you there? And we're very good at the tell, but a lot of times we have no show. And that doesn't mean that we don't confront people. That doesn't mean that we just become a doormat and let everybody walk all over us and be abusive toward us. That's not love. Sometimes love has to be a tough version of love. But real love doesn't give up on people. Love always believes the best of every person. Let me just fast forward this and say that I tried every way that I could possibly try to be a happy Christian. And the truth of the matter was, even though I had a ministry and a sizable ministry, and I was born again, had the Holy Spirit in my life, didn't have any huge personal problems, I wasn't happy. Not really. I mean, I could be happy on a day when some big spectacular thing was happening, but there was always a low-level discontentment. kind of a low-level dissatisfaction. Oh, God, I'm so tired of this. Is this all there is? I just, you know, is this all there is? And the Lord just simply said to me in my heart, you are unhappy because you're selfish. We got to stop getting the cart before the horse. Jesus said, one new commandment I give unto you that you love one another just as I have loved you. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If the body of Christ was on fire with love, the world would already be saved and we could be in heaven. So that was like a really important message to me. And I had to study love for years and years and years. And I still get refresher courses as often as I possibly can. I was about the most frustrated Christian that you could possibly be because I was hearing all these messages about what I should be and knew that I wasn't. And I was trying really hard to change. Does anybody here know what it's like to try to change? And the more you try to change, the worse you act. Well, you know, the interesting thing is, believe it or not, God really hasn't given us the job of trying. He's told us to believe. He hasn't given me or you the job of changing ourselves. He wants us to go to Him and ask Him to change us. And then when we seek God first, like I talked about last night, God may give you a plan of action. He may put something in front of you that you need to read or someone you need to talk to or something that you need to do, but it's got to be God's idea, not ours. And then it's got to be God all the way through. And then when we know it's God all the way through, then God gets all the credit. And the Bible says that he is not willing to share his glory with anybody, and that includes me and you. He's not going to let us take the credit for our own victories. And I found out the most amazing thing, and it's been a core teaching of mine for 30 some odd years, that the same grace that saves us is the same grace that changes us. It's the same grace that changes our circumstances. It's the same grace that changes our kids and changes our husbands and changes our wives, if you're a man here. That same grace that we got saved by, that came as a free gift through faith, is the same grace that we have to learn to live by. And when you learn to live every day by the grace of God, now you can have peace. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful peace. Grace is not just undeserved favor, although that is what it is, but it's also power or force. Grace is the power of the Holy Spirit coming into our life to enable us to do with ease what we can never do with any amount of struggle and effort on our own. I can't change myself. You cannot change yourself. And when somebody stands and preaches to you, 
You need to watch your mouth. That's true. You need to clean up your mind. That's true. But it's not going to do you any good at all to say, yes, bless God, I am going to go home and shut my mouth and think good thoughts. Because you won't. You say, well, then what's the point in even hearing the messages? Why should I even go listen to you if you're going to tell me to do a bunch of stuff that I can't do? Well, it's not that it can't be done, but you got to go about it the right way. Okay, so I've asked God to change me. Well, he's going to show me things to do and not to do. And God never shows us something to do or not to do without giving us the ability to do it. Amen? Amen. So yes, God changes us. We've got to let him go first. And then we have to be willing to say, God, teach me to hear your voice, to recognize the leadership of the Holy Spirit so you can walk me out of this test through the monies into the testimony. I don't want to just have a test and moan all my life. I want to end up with a testimony. You know, I think one of the most difficult things had to be going into parenthood, <laughs> being a mother um, with no solid example of what a good parent really did. That, that's intimidating for all of us stepping yeah. into parenthood because none of us know how to do it. You know, I believe with all my heart that anything that God gives you to do, He equips you to do. Mm -hmm. Because not only was my father abusive, but he was mean and violent and our house was full of just rage and anger and and my mom was just so afraid of my dad that she just didn't know what to do so she just kind of basically hid from everything so I didn't really have a good example on either side yet God gave me the grace and that's the thing that people have to realize is that grace the power of God the it's power of the Holy thing. Spirit the free gift yeah. of God's mercy and love and power in our lives covers so many of our mistakes. And of course, you know, I, I prayed all the time and it's actually kind of, I kind of laugh now because before I really knew much about prayer, which is kind of a indication, you don't have to know as much as you think you do, it's pretty simple. I would kneel down by my bed every night and this is, this is the prayer I said every night. God, please help me be a good wife and a good mother and most of all, help me be a good Christian because I know if I can do that right, everything else will work out. Yeah. And that was pretty much it. That yeah. was the extent of my prayer life. <laughs> and uh, God answered that prayer. You know, he, he helped me raise my children. That doesn't mean I didn't make mistakes. You know, I was a pretty uh, frustrated young mother. And so I took some of my frustrations out of my kids, not in, not in being abusive, but mm -hmm. I would just, I was easily angered and many times wanted something out of them they didn't know how to give me, you know, like just wanting them to keep the house neater or this or that mm -hmm. or something else. Did you see God using parenthood in your children to continue that healing in your life as well? Well, any time that you need healing in your life in any area, whether you need patience or you need long suffering or kindness, you need to more, learn more about walking in love, there always has to be people involved because that we get to practice on each other. You know, so much of the Bible is about relationships. It's about our relationship with God, our relationship with ourselves, and our relationship with people. So yes, God used my children and the fact that all four of them were uniquely different. And I didn't understand any of that. I didn't understand about God-given temperaments. I didn't, you know, I just thought everybody should be like me, which is really a big joke now because I couldn't stand myself. I didn't know that was the problem. But it was, it was very difficult and God uses it all but like I said, he gives us wisdom. Jesus has made unto us wisdom from God, according to 1 Corinthians 1. He, as we're studying the word, he gives us knowledge on how to do things that we don't even really know how to do. And so God helps us all along the way. So if, if, you, if you feel like you're a damaged person, you don't need to be afraid that you can't parent well because God will lead you in that. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not physical weapons of flesh and blood, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What is a stronghold? A stronghold is an area that's dominated by an enemy. If you're in a war and there's an enemy stronghold, 
It means that somehow the opposing party, the enemy, has managed to dig into a place and you're having a hard time getting them out of there. Well, God is getting ready to talk to us here about the mind and we have strongholds in our mind. And what that is, is areas of our thinking that Satan has somehow managed to dominate. He tells people lies. There are people sitting in here tonight, beautiful, lovely, wonderful people, but you believe lies. And because you believe those lies, they become your reality. Just like I believed lies for many, many, many years and still may have a few things that God has yet to show me that I'm not aware of. There's only one way to know when the devil's lying to you. One way and one way only, and that is to be educated in the Word of God. That's the only way. There is no other way. So let me just sit down here and act like your mama for a minute and tell you something. If you want victory, but you're not going to be a student of the Word of God, then you might as well forget it. It's not going to work. <laughs> Well, I go to church. You can go to church and sit there week after week after week and honestly not learn anything. You may get a few goosebumps. You may sing a nice song. You may even hear some sermons that are worth hearing. But what can you remember about them the next day? Now, some people do learn a lot as they hear other people teach, but nothing like what you learn when you study yourself. I believe that you learn when you listen to your pastors and prayerfully when you listen to me. I think you've got some good stuff coming at you, but I'm trying to make a point that you can't let somebody else spoon feed you the word all the time. You cannot survive on what I call secondhand faith. You have to have your own experience with God. It's good to hear my testimony. It's good to hear other people's testimonies, but I want you to get your own. Is it normal for a believer to be confused or peaceful? Peaceful. They've got it over there. Is it normal for a believer to be worried or to trust God? Is it normal for a believer to be positive or negative? Positive. Passive or active? Active. Decisive or double-minded? Look what you guys know. So see, anybody who sits around and thinks garbage all day, it's not because we don't know any better. We do get lazy. Sometimes we just get spiritually lazy, and sometimes we just forget, and sometimes we just get tired of it. And that's why God leads us to come to things like this, because now here, I'm going to yell at you for one hour to get your mind straightened out get your mouth straightened out, get some stability, and you know what? You're going to have a better week than you would have if you wouldn't have come. Then, then about the time we start to backslide, you'll turn on the TV program, and I'll be saying it again in a different way, or you'll go to church on Sunday, and your pastor will say it in a different way. That's why we have to continue to hear the Word of God, hear the Word of God, hear the Word of God. Deceived thinking is a huge problem. Things like, my past dictates my future. Everybody say, that's a lie. <laughs> it's too late for me. <laughs> this is too hard, I just can't do it. <laughs> I'm so mistreated, nobody has it as bad as me. <laughs> God's mad at me. <laughs> I'm inferior to other people. <laughs> See, you're pretty smart, aren't you? then what is the problem? You know what the problem is? It's not what we shout out in church. It's what we do in the midnight hour. When there is no pretty music and there is no spiritual cheerleader on the platform and it's just me and God and my messes or your tired aching body or your bills that you're tired of looking at that's when we got to think right. That's when we got to think right. Come on, I said, that's when we got to think right. That's where the victory comes in.
Well, the three things that we talked about today while we're making our journey with God toward healing is loving God, loving yourself, and loving other people. Wow, so important. Number two, living by the grace of God. And number three, the mind. What are we gonna do with our minds? These are foundational teachings, things that I've learned. And you know what? I am living proof that studying the Word of God and applying it in your life brings healing from past abuse. God changed me and God can change you. I want you to meet my buddy, Angela. She is seven years old. She's very, very ticklish. We've been able to make an impact in Angela and her family's life after a very devastating loss. You see, we're here in Zambia and water is a huge need here. Even though we are right along the banks of the Zambezi River where you think water would be plentiful, but that water is extremely dangerous. And Angela lost one of her sisters to a crocodile along the river as they were gathering water. If you can even imagine such a loss as a parent, as a sister, to lose someone that you love in such a terrible way. This is the biggest river in Zambia. So there were a lot of problems. There are a lot of crocodiles in the river. There are a lot of hippos in the river. The most affected are people, their children. Uh, I lost my daughter, cut by the crocodile. I sent her to go and fetch water. How old was she? Ten years. Ten years old? Yes. Every time we, uh, we fetch water from that side, we, we drink it direct without uh, putting any chemical in it. As you can see, this is, these are just villages. They don't have uh, money to buy chlorine or any chemical to purify water. So uh, we had uh, uh, diseases like uh, dysentery, diarrhea, of uh, waterborne diseases. We were crying for clean water. How many people would you say were, were sick from waterborne illness during that time? There were many. If you, even if you go to the clinic there, they will give you the number. The people were suffering from this diarrhea and so forth. Now we are happy. We are drinking clean water. We are living a better life. Now we are getting good water, safe water. Yes, even crocodiles are no more accident for crocodiles. We thank you very much for what you are doing. And people are healthier? Yes, very much. This ball which is set here, it's not from, uh, from you. It's not from Hand of Opal itself, but it's from God himself. So they thank, you, they thank God for bringing hand of hope, to bring all that support all the way to here. It is safe, madam. We are happy on that. And all the people now are very happy. Praise to God. God loves us. Thank you. Edith and her three girls are gathering water, they don't have to be in fear. They don't have to be in fear of the dangers of the river, of the animals, of the disease that the water carries. And we are so grateful that you have been right here with us to provide this for them. It's through your love for Christ and it's in sharing that love with Edith, her girls, and the entire village in this area that you are changing the world one little bit at a time. Well, here at the ministry, we strive to help people both here in the U.S. and around the world. We do that by providing help such as the gospel, medical care, 
clean water feeding programs. It's like being part of one big family, and today I'm inviting you to join the family. If you're not a partner with Joyce Meyer Ministries, we would so appreciate your commitment to become one. We don't ask for or require any certain amount of money. All that we ask you to do is pray and then do what you believe that God has asked you to do and to do it consistently. It's the consistency that is really important to us because we're consistently on television daily around the world and so we need consistent partners that are going to stick with us. And not only will you be helping preach the gospel through television, but all these many, many thousands upon thousands of outreaches, people being fed and clean water being provided and medical care and putting books into prisons and all the things that Jesus tells us not to forget to do. And so I believe that you will pray and that if God puts it on your heart to join the family, I believe that you will. So thank you for your consideration. God bless you.